Hey. Good afternoon, everyone. Nice to see so many faces. Um, so, on Afghanistan, this morning, the Under Secretary General for Humanitarian Affairs, Martin Griffiths, briefed members on the humanitarian situation in the country um, and in, on his recent visit there as part of an interagency standing committee mission. Mr. Griffith said that they told the de facto authorities that a 24th December edict barring women from working for national and international NGOs is doing no favors to the people of Afghanistan, for the people of Afghanistan. Women are an essential central component of the humanitarian operation in Afghanistan, he stressed, noting that if the ban is not revoked, more exceptions are needed to allow female aid workers to resume their activities. He noted that we have received exceptions in the health and education sectors, which have enabled activities to restart. Mr. Griffiths also underscored that humanitarian agencies will continue to work and be present in Afghanistan unless there is a blanket opposition to women working. The humanitarian community does not go on strike, but seeks ways to work in a principled manner. This year's humanitarian response plan for Afghanistan is seeking $4.6 billion to help 28 million people in need, with some 6 million people close to famine. Um, turning to Ukraine, our humanitarian colleagues on the ground tell us that the fierce fighting continues in the eastern Donetsk region, with civilians being killed and injured on both sides of the front line. Over the last 24 hours, the frontline city of Bakhmut reportedly came under intensive shelling again. Children were among those killed and injured. Thousands of people who remain in the city experience constant shelling, forcing them to spend hours in shelters, while access to basic services, including health care, is extremely limited. Civilians were also reportedly killed and injured in the areas of the Donetsk region under the temporary military control of the Russian Federation. And civilians have also been killed in key civilian infrastructure, including dozens of homes, um, uh, have been reportedly damaged in the east, north, and south of Ukraine over the past 24 hours. We continue to support the most, support the most affected communities near the front line. Yesterday, a humanitarian interagency convoy delivered food, water, medicine, emergency shelter materials, hygiene items, a generator, and other supplies for winter to the town of Toretsk, which is some 10 kilometers from the front line in the Donetsk region. The convoy also delivered trauma and emergency surgery kit supplies. Approximately 15,000 people of the 75,000 residents who lived there before the, war, uh, before the war started are still in that town and nearby communities. They depend on humanitarian assistance. The supplies were provided by the International Organization for Migration, UNICEF, the UN Refugee Agency, the World Food Program, and the World Health Organization. Um, and I have a trip announcement this afternoon, the Deputy Secretary General Amina Mohammed will depart to Rome, Italy at the invitation of the Pontifical Academy of Social Sciences to participate in the Fraternal Economy of Integral and Sustainable Development Workshop. This will be held on 2nd and 3rd of February in Vatican City. In addition to taking part in the workshop and upon the request of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the international and international cooperation, she will meet with the Deputy Prime Minister and Minister for Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation. And she will also meet with our Rome-based agencies to discuss the forthcoming food systems stock, stock dig moment. She will be back here with us on Sunday. And in South Sudan, I want to flag that our mission there today has raised serious concerns over the reported buildup of the Aguelic forces in Upper Nile State in the past few days. In a statement, the mission urged these forces, loyal to General Johnson Ohlone, to refrain from any actions or movements that might pose threats to civilians and affect humanitarian operations in Upper Nile and Northern Jungle. Uh, our peacekeepers are increasing their presence in the area, and the mission is verifying reports of movement and mobilization. The mission underscored that it continues to engage with government, state officials, and other leaders to prevent any further escalation of tensions following fierce fighting that began last November. And we have an update from our peacekeeping mission in the Central African Republic, known as MINUSCA. This week, the mission pursued its electoral awareness campaign in Oboe and in Bria to encourage strong participation in the local elections. 
The mission also conducted a security assessment in the Wuhan prefecture ahead of the planned closure of the peacekeeping base in Kuki, which contributed to improving security in the area. In the last week, the mission carried out 1,927 patrols, including eight jointly with the National Defense Forces. And the mission continued to coordinate with the Ministry of Interior and the Minister of Defense and the General Directorates of the Gendarmerie and the police to facilitate the countrywide recruitment drive for internal security forces. And a report from our colleagues at the UN Office on Drugs and Crime uh, came out today on the trafficking of medical products in the Sahel. And it says that the high prevalence of infectious diseases, including malaria, coupled with challenges to access healthcare, is creating an environment in which the demand for medical products and services is not fully met through former channels. According to UNODC, this leaves room for trafficking, provides an incentive for the involvement of organized criminal groups, and fuels the ongoing threat to public safety in the region. For example, in Sub-Saharan Africa, as many as 267,000 deaths per year are linked to falsified and substandard anti-malarial malarial medicines. The study also estimates that about 40% of the substandard and falsified medical products reported in the Sahel, in the Sahel countries between 2013 and 2021, was discovered in unregulated pharmaceutical outlets. Um, you can find the full study online. And um, I have two resident coordinators to announce today. Um, our development coordination office tells us that Christine Umutoni of Rwanda and Aminata Maiga of Cote d'Ivoire are taking up their post today in Liberia and Senegal, respectively. They were appointed by the Secretary General and confirmed by the host governments. And as you know, resident coordinators lead our UN teams on the ground to rescue the sustainable development goals and support authorities to tackle development emergencies. And their full bios are available online. And today we mark the start of World Interfaith Harmony Week. This occasion aims to promote a culture of peace and nonviolence. It was first proposed by King Abdullah II of Jordan at the United Nations in 2010, and it was quickly adopted by the GA. Um, it calls on governments, institutions, and civil society to observe it with various programs and initiatives that would promote the objectives of the week. And today, after I'm done here, Paulina will brief you. And then at 1 p.m., there will be a briefing by Ambassador Vanessa Frazier, the permanent representative of Malta, and president of the Security Council for the month of February. And she will discuss the program of work. And this is perhaps a record. Today, we thank five countries who have made their contributions to the budget. Um, they are Barbados, Cyprus, Malaysia, the Republic of Korea, and Malta, so you can thank them in person. So we thank them for their payments, and the honor roll now totals 25. So I'll be happy to take your questions now. Yes, Edie. Uh, thank you very much, and welcome back to the podium. Um, today is the second anniversary of the military coup in Myanmar and the military government announced that it is extending the state of emergency that it imposed on February 1st, 2021 for another six months. Does the Secretary General have any comment on the anniversary and this extension of the state of emergency? I mean, I think you, you all saw his um, statement already on this um, marking of the two years. I think he was very clear that um, he is concerned about all the violence that is going on there, on there. not just the violence, but this is a multidimensional crisis. Um, and you know, I think he was very clear that we need to prioritize the safety of the people of Myanmar. Um, and basically that these people um, need to be able to live free of violence and intimidation and feel free to um, express their views and opinions. And without that, it's gonna be very difficult to have any progress in the country. Um, so we are very much um, looking forward to seeing developments that lead into um, to this direction. Uh, yes, Maggie. 
Thanks, Florencia. Welcome to the podium. Um, the Pakistani ambassador said during Mr. Griffith's briefing just now about Afghanistan that there will be this uh, conference on women and Islam on March 8th here at the UN. The DSG said last week it would be in the region. Uh, is this the same conference? Has it been decided? Are you? Can you announce it? I don't have details on that yet, but I do know that the DSG said it would be in the region and we would prefer it to be in the region. However, I have no confirmation of these details. Okay, if you find out something, will yes. you let us know? And then um, the New York Times had a story yesterday that uh, the developer who owns the, plot, the big plot of land next door to the UN uh, is planning to put up a big development that includes a casino, maybe a Ferris wheel. <laughs> I was wondering if the UN has been made aware of the plans, if it has any opposition to them, if it thinks it will be a security issue to have a casino there during UNGA or a benefit. <laughs> um, <laughs> what's sure, your reaction? <laughs> I'm sure a lot of the delegates would like to unwind. Like They do like to unwind after very long meetings. I'm sure maybe they would welcome that. Um, I, I don't think, I am not aware of any formal uh, sort of notification to us on that front. We have seen the reports and we'll see how it, how it shakes out. Yes. Thank you. On Afghanistan, it, one thing is, is not clear with, about the, from Martin Griffith's briefing to Security Council and, and what he said on Monday is, is there right now in Afghanistan male only humanitarian activities? by the UN or its humanitarian partners? I mean, I think, I, I know that this question has been asked repeatedly and it was asked of Martin and the DSG and I think our message is like really very clear that we need women to deliver humanitarian assistance. Their role is essential in every sector. Um, and that's why, we, that's why we've met with them to ask for these exemptions, right? Uh, it is a very complex issue, um, and you know we can't like for sure say every single operation there are women and men equal. You know what I mean? It's it's it goes on a case by case basis. Things are not so clear cut. Um, so I think it's important to keep the conversations and the dialogue going. The de facto authorities to ensure that women are still allowed um, to do the humanitarian work. Um, and the, but the bottom line really. Um, which is what we want to focus on, is that um, while the situation is very, very fluid, we are committed um, to keep delivering this humanitarian aid and to seize every opportunity to provide assistance to, to Afghans um, with both male and female staff. Uh, so I feel like you didn't answer my question. Is there right now, you're not sure or you don't know if there's um, male-only uh, humanitarian activities, and has there been exclusions of women from any of the UN programs as, as of today? I mean, as I said, that the, each operation is different, and each, and they're very complex operations. So we, um, that's what I said, it, it, it depends. Um, I would refer you to Martin's office, who can give you more details on, on, on each of the, op, uh, of the operations. Well, well that's... And just one, one more thing about that. What is Secretary General himself's thoughts about this? Isn't he concerned that, um, you know, a, a national government putting conditions on humanitarian programs and United Nations regarding um, certain group, in this case women, to be excluded will become a precedent, make countries like, for example, Turkey ex asking maybe in future to exclude Kurds from the humanitarian program, or the Chinese ask the Muslim Uyghurs to be excluded from a certain UN program. What is his thoughts about all this? I mean, I think, you know, the Deputy Secretary General, when she briefed, she was very clear, right, about how there are humanitarian principles, and one of the humanitarian principles is non-discrimination. Um, so that would mean that everyone uh, needs needs this this assistance. Everyone in need should get this assistance, and that position is has not changed. Um, and of course, this is why we're still fighting and 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 to to get this aid delivered and talking to the de facto authorities. Um, and obviously, this is not just in Afghanistan. This this is everywhere, right? Like we we need everyone to be able to access assistance in the most vulnerable. Um, with, without preconditions, that's the nature of, of humanitarian assistance. Um, yep, yeah, here. <clears throat> uh, you say uh, there are 
civilian casualties in Ukraine and both sides of the front line. As for the territory controlled by the legitimate authorities, everything is clear. Uh, but as for the territories occupied by Russia, where do you get your data on casualties? Uh, what, are, what are your sources? I mean, as you know, we have um, teams on the ground. Um, they are obviously not everywhere. <laughs> So we are not the, and we know that since the situation changes all the time on the ground, uh, so do uh, reports for ca from casualties. But we have uh, colleagues working there. We have um, the Human Rights Office um, reporting. So that, that's pretty much where we get it from. Next question. Um, Edie, follow up. Um, uh, just a question on Haiti, uh, follow up to last week's Security Council briefing by Helen Lalim. Um, has the Secretary General received uh, any new offers of uh, troops or police for Haiti? Um, as of now, no. You may be referring to some media reports we've seen, but uh, as of now, nothing official that has come to us. Thanks. Uh, thank you. The Israeli government uh, continues uh, its uh, punitive measures against Palestinians. Since the beginning of this year, it has demolished uh, 96 homes and commercial buildings. And there is a plan now to demolish, demolish 14, 14 homes in Jerusalem in the next few days. And uh, the collective punishment is illegal under international law. Uh, do you have anything to say on this? Any call to Can Israel? You collective? Punishment. I mean, I think on the situation there, I think we have been very um, vocal about it. Um, Mr. Wenisland has talked about this. The, S the Secretary General has talked about this. Um, things in the region right now are not optimal, to put it uh, to put it one way. However, we continue to um, stand against all forms of collective punishment, and I think you know it is crucial to do whatever we can. It is crucial for parties to do whatever they can in the region to lower tensions, to de-escalate. And that's what our focus uh, and Mr. Vanensland's work has been uh, focusing on. Someone um, has their mic on on the chat, so could you please mute your mics? Um, any more questions? Is there any question, uh, Stefano? Yes. Thank you. Is a follow-up on uh, what we were talking before about Afghanistan. Uh, we, so we had in a few days two press conferences yeah. here. Um, but it looks like what they're saying is practically we have to wait, see what the Taliban are, are going to do after we told them what's, what, what probably is going to happen if they don't allow women to work, in, especially in the humanitarian. So practically a disaster, practically, I mean, Possibly even a million people can die of uh, starvation or, or cold and so on. Um, so because here in this room, I think it was asked, but I don't think the answer was, uh, I mean, Mr. Griffith said, I've been working with the Taliban a long time and I know putting pressure on them is not wise because they react. So um, what is plan B? If What if the Taliban, especially after seeing what they saw here, as a response, uh, what if the Taliban are too slow? I'm not going to say they just give a damn because uh, the deputy secretary told us that their goal, that's, that's our, our words, is to put women back on the 13th century. Now, I don't know how many people were dying in Afghanistan on the 13th century of freezing or, or something, but probably many. The point is here. What is the message of the Secretary General or somebody from the UN to tell to the Taliban, if you let people starve or die for your trying to put women back on the 13th century, 
we are going to punish you. Are you ready to do that? Right. So I think what the Deputy Secretary General said is we're trying to bring the Taliban from the 13th to the 21st century. Um, and I think we have been very vocal about making not just Afghanistan, but pretty much the entire world aware that if half of your population doesn't have any rights, your society as a whole is not going to have any progress. So I think that has been very, very, um, very clear. Um, and the other thing is, I think, you know, Martin uh, is, deals with the humanitarian side of things. Um, and obviously, he himself has said it, this is not, that is not a long-term solution, right? There needs to be a political track um, and that is something that, you know, we, we are working on. But I feel like we have not minced our words. I feel like we have been very clear that the Deputy Secretary General went there and said it very straightforwardly. So, you know, this is where we are. And I wouldn't want to speculate or about what will happen in the future. Um, in, Just in have scenarios. a quick follow-up. The problem here is if we were talking about a crisis that then can make, you know, things unpleasant, but the way it was described by Mr. Griffith, and before, was described like that the situation could, 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 could be catastrophic, all of a sudden catastrophic. So the question again is, for example, a few years ago, when a situation was a different, they were, they were killed, but could have become a genocide in the, in the situation of uh, uh, um, Myanmar with the Rohingya, well, the Secretary General intervened before few weeks before, a few days before, to make the, 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 the Security Council move on time. So I just, my question again, I repeat. I, I was trying to ask this question to Griffith, but I, um, fortunately, they, they were not uh, enough time. There was not enough time. The point is, OK, when you deliver a message to the Taliban thinking that you that they're going to change, they're going to do exceptions, and so the situation gets better. But did you give them, I mean, is, if it's not Mr. Griffith, there's a human, uh, is a, with the humanitarian help, but somebody at the UN, uh, Mr. Guterres, somebody else, is it giving a message to the Taliban that for pro the protection of a civilian, you know, the responsibility to protect, they have a responsibility. If they don't, you know, if they let people die, the UN will do something. I mean, I think they, as I said, they have said this to them, and they know what the, they, they, there have been warnings about, for example, the very harsh winter that is coming. So yes, this has been communicated, and I wouldn't want to speculate on any further scenarios. Uh, yes, here. Thank you. Just following up on Afghanistan, we heard from uh, the representatives over the past couple of weeks about how their remit is really humanitarian affairs, and that's very clear. Um, and they made the point that what's really needed is, is a political solution. So where is that impetus going to come from? Who's going to lead the charge looking for a political solution to the situation in Afghanistan? Well, as you know, all, all of our, our, our mission there, our representative there, continues its work. It's complex. Um, it's probably... Um, Something that, something that is ongoing, and when we have something to announce, uh, if there is any progress, we will do so. But for now, the work continues. Um, I think Iftikhar had a question online, and then I'll come back to the room. Uh, thank you. Welcome to the briefing. Uh, I just need a clarification since I joined a bit late. What was the purpose of the meeting that Mr. Uh, Griffith addressed today? Oh, this was a uh, this was a member state uh, briefing, which member states get on a regular basis. So he gave it at ten thirty, and I believe you can watch it on Web TV. It's been archived. Uh, Maggie, uh, Florencia, I just see that the Secretary General's meeting with the South Korean Foreign Minister this afternoon. Um, do you have any details on the agenda, or could you? Uh, send us a readout when it's over. I do not. I will do my best to get you some details. Anyone else? No? Thank you very much. And uh, Paulina, you're up. <laughs> 